Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. I pray all is well with you. Um, please turn in your Bibles to Matthew 25, 41. We've been doing a series in the last few weeks on hell. Who was hell for and where is hell? Abraham's bosom and all that stuff. So if you haven't watched those studies, um, what was it? One is there's a room in hell and the other one is uh, did Jesus burn in hell? Okay. Those are great studies the Lord blessed me with to share with you, brothers and sisters in Christ. So, Matthew 25, 41. We read, make sure you're getting your King James Bibles out, brothers and sisters in Christ. And like I said, you can pause the video. I don't always turn to the scriptures, not because I'm trying to motivate you not to. It's because these videos would be so long if I had to turn. I'm a slow turner, and I love to use scripture after scripture after scripture. I love the Word of God. I love comparing scripture with scripture how we're supposed to study the Word of God, um, being good stewards of the Scripture. So, to cut the time down on the video, I just have my notes here, and I have the, the verses printed out here, and sometimes I'll turn, sometimes I won't. But you, Brother Sis Christ, you can pause the video, and you can turn to every verse we do. That's how I used to, that's how I watch other brethren who do studies. Pause the video, and I turn. It helps you go through the Scriptures, and it helps you to Hide the Word of God in your heart if you're reading along as the brother is preaching and teaching. Okay? That's why my favorite teachers are ones that actually read from the Scriptures. Okay? I love Bible studies. I don't mind uh, witnessing and teachings that are based off of witnessing, like testimonies. But my favorite teachings are Bible preaching, Bible teachings, where they're comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture. That being said, Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. We're back to Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye accursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now I had a brother in Christ, I had a great fellowship talk with the brother in Christ in the comment section of one of my videos. I think it was, Did Jesus burn in hell or is there room in hell? It's one of the two. And the question got brought up that um, the word devil here, is it talking about Satan or is it talking about the evil spirits that's under the Old Testament? Because you have devil and you have devils, plural. Okay. Now, if you notice here, it says prepared for the devil. When you say the, let's say, there, let's say there's uh, ten cars in a parking lot. And you tell someone that you left your book on the top of the car, you're talking about one specific car out of all of them. It's not all of them in general, it's that one car. The car. I have two dogs. If I say, can you take care of the dog, I'm talking about one of them. Which one do I need to be taken care of? I'm talking about a specific one. But it says here, prepared for the devil. It's talking about a specific devil. There's, it's not devils, plural. It also says that his angels prepared for the devil and his angels. Revelation 12, 9. If you want to turn to Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. This is where we get the answer to this. Is Matthew 25, 41 talking about evil spirits when it says the devil? Or is it talking about Satan? Now, ultimately, I, I believe that the evil spirits, when we, I'm getting ahead of myself, that they're going to go to, to the lake of they're going to wind up in the lake of fire eventually someday. Absolutely, but was it prepared for the evil spirits? And we're we're going to talk a little bit about where the the devils plural evil spirits came from. All right. So Revelation twelve nine, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil. Now people will say, well, we'll get to this, but people will say, well, it's capital D. So capital D devil is the only thing that means Satan. Eh, we're going to get there. I'm going to prove that that's wrong. Anytime it says the devil singular, whether it's capital D or lowercase d, it's talking about Satan. But we see here called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. So that's how we know that one of Satan's titles is the devil. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. His angels. So when you compare this scripture to what we're reading in Matthew 25, the devil there, Satan, and his angels, is going to be the third of the angels that get drawn, that he draws with the 
the tail, his tail, the dragon's tail. Okay? Uh, Revelation 20, Revelation chapter 20, verse 2, hop over a few chapters. Revelation 22, we read, And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent. Notice he keeps saying old. We're going to talk about the first time the serpent's mentioned in the Bible. That old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So we know the devil is talking about Satan. It's talking about um, that old dragon, that I mean, the old serpent, the, the red dragon. Right. Now, people, like I said, people will say that D capital it has to be capital D to be talking about um, Satan. Really? Well, my question I'd ask is, who tempted Jesus in the wilderness? You guys remember that story? Turn to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to be jumping around because we're not going to go into detail because this isn't a study on why he was tempted and how he was tempted. It's just the point we're going to make here is, who tempted him? Okay. Matthew chapter 4 verse 1. Then was Jesus led up in the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Notice devil there is lowercase d. The devil. If you pop down to verse 5, then the devil taketh him up to the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. Matthew 4, 8. Again, the devil taketh him into the exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Jump down to verse 11. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, an angel came and ministered unto him. The devil. Devil's not capitalized. Is it still talking about Satan? Absolutely. Satan's who tempted Jesus Christ in the wilderness. When we get Matthew 25, verse 41, it says, Prepare for the devil. It's talking about Satan. Remember, we're going to get to this a little bit more later, but he tempted Jesus with offering him the world. Who's the lowercase g God of this world? Satan, the devil. That's, how, that's another way you can find out that this is talking about Satan. Satan's the one that's tempting Jesus Christ. Satan's the one trying to offer him the world because Satan's the lowercase g God of this world. Okay. But you ask, what about the evil spirits then? Matthew 8, 16. This is just one example. So if you turn to Matthew 8, 16, try to keep it all in Matthew. Matthew 8, 16. There's other examples like this in the, in the Gospels. It says, When even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. Now you got an S there. Devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. So we know devils, plural, is talking about spirits. And in some other passage, it will talk about evil spirits. I believe when it's talking about devils, plural, it's talking about evil spirits. Now I believe these spirits came about, this is my theory, I believe these spirits came about in the flood. The mighty men that were born through the angels that left their first estate and married the daughters of men. Okay, I was talking to the Brother Christ, it says these giants. Well, if you read it, it says, in those days there was giants. Also, it's like and or also, angels came and there were mighty men born to the women that the angels came and took wives of men. We've talked about this in other studies. Um, took wives of men, and it says also there were mighty men. So they're two different things, I believe. People think that they, these mighty men are those giants. It says there was giants in those days. Let's look for that verse real quick. Just so I can get it right. Here it is, Genesis 6-4. There were giants in the earth in those days. There was. And also, that's an addition. Also, after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Okay, you have giants in the earth. Sometimes I think those giants aren't necessarily people, even though they're trying to say they're people. Those giants there could be a reference to the dinosaurs, the animals, the beasts. You have the Leviathan, you have the behemoth mentioned in the Bible. These are giants. Okay, if they're talking about men, they're talking about men. I'm not trying to get into a big debate or disagreement with that. My point that I'm making, brothers and sisters, Christ, 
is it separates the two. You have giants in those days, and also you have, let's see, and also you have these mighty men. The mighty men are separate. These mighty men are different, okay? They're different from the giants. They're different from regular men. Hebrews 2.6, if you want to turn all the way, you didn't have to turn there, but I just want to make sure I was quoting that properly. Hebrews 2.6, if you turn to Hebrews 2.6, this is the one where we learn that men were created a little lower than the angels. I believe angels have a body, soul, and spirit. I do. We were created a little lower than the angels. We have a body, soul, and spirit. But is our body and our soul and our spirit exactly the same as the angels' body, soul, and spirit? No. We're made a little lower, though. We're close. What Hebrews 2.6, because I know there's some brethren out there that teach angels are just spirit beings and they don't have bodies. They do have bodies. Okay. That right there, what we just read, proved it. They left their first estate, they came down here, they took women as wives, they knew them, and, they bear, and the women bear children. You have to have a body to do that. Angels do have bodies, okay? Do they have the same body we have? No. In the Bible, you hear it talking about how they killed, one time there was an angel that, I believe is the, is the angel of the Lord, it's, it's, it's God manifest in the flesh, but you got an angel killing tons of people in one night. You got an angel that's uh, blinding everybody outside the door. Remember Lot? He was trying to reason with the men of Sodom, and they were about to come in and grab him, and those angels smote them with blindness and brought him in and said, okay, we've got to get you out of here. I can't smite a whole group of people with blindness. Okay? Now, there's prophets that did miracles, don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying these angels, there's something more to them. But Hebrews 2, 6, it says, but one, is, but one in a certain place testifieth, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. There's where we get that patch. We're made a little bit lower than the angels. We have a body, soul, and spirit. We're made in the likeness of God. Man was made in the image of God, and that man that was made in the image of God was Adam. Okay? Man is in the image of God as far as God is a man. I'm a man. God is a man. Jesus is a man. He's not man and woman. Okay? That's, that's heresy. I always teach, brothers says Christ, that we are made, men and women are made in the likeness of God. Man was made in the image of God. Image is just the body. It's not talking about the spirit. It's not talking about the soul. It's talking about just the body. And Adam was created perfect. He was in the true image of God. What's the image of God? Remember, brothers and Christ? That's Jesus Christ. Jesus is the image of God. Adam was made in the image. That's why you have the first Adam, and you've got the second Adam, Jesus Christ. All right. Adam was created perfect, and then he sinned. Turn to 1 Corinthians 2.11. All right. So I want to make a big deal of this. Like I said, this is just a theory as far as where these evil spirits came from. Remember, we're talking about the mighty men. Okay? What happened? There was a flood. The flood killed the mighty men. But what happened to their spirit? Their body was killed, but what happened to the spirit? 1 Corinthians 2.11 we read, For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so... Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the capitalist Spirit of God. You want to know God, you have to have the Holy Spirit. Open this book to you and teach you who God is. Teach us to fear God. Truly fear God. we got the laws of God written on every man's heart that helps us to fear God. But to truly fear God. Right? But the point we're getting for this study is, is that the spirit of man. A man has a certain spirit that's the spirit of man. Turn with me to he back to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. What about the angels? What do they have? Hebrews 1, 6. And again, and again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits. And his ministers a flame of fire. Angels have spirits? Yeah. 
and it's proven that angels have body. Now, I can't be 100% odd. Like, where does it say that an angel has a soul? But they've got a body and they've got a spirit. That's pretty much clear. But angels have their, have their type of spirit. Man has their type of spirit. Like I said, this is just a theory. Please, if you disagree, show in the scriptures. By all means, show in the scriptures. This is just a theory. Where the devils are. What's fact is, is you have the devil, which is Satan, and then you have the devils, plural, which are evil spirits. That is truth. The Bible backs this up. Okay. Now, the reason I read these verses, brothers and Christ, is because I believe these mighty men, they weren't 100% man, and they weren't 100% angel. They were in between. They had the body of a man, but mightier. They were mightier, but they still had the body of a man. Why? Because when the flood happened, it killed them. It killed them. But what about their spirit? Could their spirit have been more closer to like an angel spirit? Which is why that their spirits endured after the flood. And that's when, I'm getting ahead of myself again, we're going to talk. That's when evil spirits started getting mentioned after the flood. Now if I'm wrong and you can show me before the flood that I was wrong. But I was looking as like, most of the time you hear them mentioning about evil spirits. Where God sends no... Um, Saul, that evil spirit, to vex him when he's standing up there and he says, who will go to these prophets? And then this spirit comes up and says, I will be a lying spirit. You know, these evil spirits still have to answer to God too. Just as much as Satan has to go and answer to God in Job, in the book of Job. Satan has to answer to God. I believe these evil spirits have to answer to God too. These evil spirits that Jesus is cast, casting out, they fell down and worshipped him. How thou come to destroy us before the time? I know who, the, uh, who thou art, the Holy One of God. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I don't know if they said it specifically like that, but they were telling him that he was, he was the Son of God. He's the Holy One of God. Right? I believe these evil spirits, they were showing reverence to Jesus in his earthly ministry. I believe in when they have that evil spirit come before God saying, I will go and be a lying spirit in these prophets. If you remember that story in the Old Testament. And the prophets would prophesy lying. They were lying to the king. Telling the king what he wanted to hear. Not telling him what he needed to hear. Right? I believe they had a body of men, though mighty indeed. I'm just reading my notes real quick. Though mighty indeed, which died in the flood... But they had the spirit of angels. That spirit could have survived, and I believe it did, the flood and became evil spirits. Okay, This is my theory. Right? You say, because part of the talking with that brother in Christ, and it was a great fellowship. I enjoy talking with the brethren. He was saying, well, what if it's those angels? The, well, what if those angels were the evil spirits? Turn to uh, Second Peter, because angels have spirits. What if they became the evil spirits? doesn't work out when you turn to Second Peter chapter 2. Verse 4. Some of you know this one. For God, if God spared not the angels that sinned, past tense. Remember, when this comes out, the third of the angels in heaven, that the red dragon pulls to earth with this, his tail, they haven't fallen yet. So when it says, for God spared not the angels that sinned, past tense, who is this talking about? It's talking about the angels before the flood that left their first estate and came down here. And took wives of men, of the daughters of men. Right? When we talk about this in other studies, the wives of the daughters of men. Angels are men. They look like men. They're not men, but they look like men. Right? They're, we are made a little lower than the angels. Man is made a little lower than the angels. Talk about man, not women. Man is made a little lower than the angels. Okay? But angels look like men. Right? For if God spared not the angels that sin, it's talking about in the Old Testament, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved until the day of judgment. Where are those angels after the flood? They're in hell. They're in chains. So these evil spirits can't be them. These devils, plural, can't be them. Okay? So that is... That is where they are, in hell and chains, waiting for the day of judgment, the great white throne judgment, after the first earth and heaven are done away with. When the ultimate judgment dones, everyone that hasn't been judged yet gets judged. Because remember, there's the judgment seat of Christ, where we're going to get judged, brothers and sisters of Christ, after the catching away of the body of Christ. 
And there's a great white throne judgment where everyone else at the end that hasn't been judged yet is going to get judged. It's going to be predominantly the lost world. Death and hell being brought up. It's the lost world getting judged. But I've been talking with some brethren and some saved people can get judged there and they get to go into the new heaven and the new earth. Okay, but there's, it's a judgment. They're waiting for that judgment, these angels, for this specific topic, what we're talking about. Those angels are waiting for that judgment. That's where they are. They cannot be the evil spirits that are being cast out or the false gods being worshipped in the Old Testament. Those angels are being reserved in hell. They're in prison. They're, they're in the burning side of hell. Remember we talked about the burning side of hell where there's destruction, corruption, I mean, where they're being constantly corrupted and destroyed. They don't die, but they're constantly being suffering for all eternity. And then you had Abraham's bosom where it was a prison, but there was no corruption. They're just in a prison waiting to be set free. Good example of that was Paul. Okay, They wanted to whip Paul and scourge Paul. And God saved him from that. Paul's like, would you uh, condemn a Roman, uh, uh, scourge a Roman being uncondemned? Paul was a prisoner, but he didn't see corruption the way Jesus Christ did on the cross. Okay. He took on the sins of the world. Okay. I'm just using that as an analogy for, the t uh, for the, um, Abraham's bosom, but this is the study we already did. Abraham's bosom. Okay. It's a prison, but there was no corruption. So those angels are in hell, and I just mentioned evil spirits as false gods in the Old Testament. Evil spirits do not appear until after the flood. Like I said, if I miss something, I miss something. Be, by all means, put it in the comment section. If I miss a, something where they mentioned a spirit that you think is evil before the flood. okay? You had Satan before the flood, which I'm getting a little ahead of myself, and he was there trying to deceive people. Okay, but it's not until after the flood that you start hearing about evil spirits. Okay. Now the world, now the word devils plural only appears four times in the Old Testament. Only four times in the Old Testament. We're not going to go there, but Le Leviticus seventeen seven. Do and you can like I said pause the video after every one of these if you want to turn to them. Leviticus seventeen seven. Deuteronomy thirty two seventeen. 2 Corinthians 11.15 and Psalms 106.37 All these references to evil spirits are in reference of being worshipped as false gods. All the false gods in the Old Testament are these evil spirits. Now the first thing i got to remind the brethren is it's like how do these evil spirits get to a point where they're getting worshipped by man? Okay. What does Satan use to deceive people? What's Satan's number one tool that he uses to deceive anyone? I believe he's using it to deceive the third of the angels that he pulls to earth when that time comes, when those angels fall. What's the number one thing he uses, brothers and Christ? Turn back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. Genesis 3, 5. And ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. What does what is Satan always try to promise people to get them on his side? He promises them godhood. Now, I can't say that's what he did, but in the Old Testament, could Satan have, have had the mighty men on his side? And after they died, the evil spirits, could he promise the evil spirits, hey, ye shall be worshipped as gods? That's what he promises everybody. He promised Adam, he promised Eve this, he lied to Eve. He promises mankind today that ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil. Yea, hath God said. A better rendering would be. I call it the yea, hath God said. A better rendering would be game. He gets men to do that. He gets men today to act like God. I can correct this book. I can decide what's right and wrong for me. I can decide what direction I want to go and how I want to live. He can be as God's. Turn to Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. We're going to go back to what we were just talking about with, with uh, Jesus being tempted by Satan. Okay? 
What does Satan offer people you can be as gods? He offers them the world. But there's a catch. He offers them the world and that you'll be worshipped as gods, but there's always a catch with Satan. What's that catch? Matthew 4, 8. Again, the devil, let's talk about Satan here, taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. The kingdoms of the world. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. What does Satan offer Jesus? The world. You can be worshipped as God. Actually, Jesus is God. But what he offers everybody, and he tried to tempt Jesus with, I'll give you the world. if you. But here's the catch. You'll be worshipped as God, but here's the catch. All of you that get worshipped as gods, you have to worship me. That's what Satan's saying. You have to worship me. That's the catch. That's always the catch with him. He wants to be like the Most High. Okay? Satan offers Jesus the world to be worshipped just below Satan. Okay? That's what he offers everyone. Did he offer those evil spirits that? I believe he did. Is he going to offer the third of those angels that? I believe he did. Does he offer mankind that? Yes, he does. He offers them the world to be worshipped. Ye can be his gods. Okay? And Jesus responds with, there's only one God. And we're going to read 1 Corinthians 8, 6. But that's where we get the, the, the most strongest verse on this that disproves the Trinity, the pagan Trinity, just like that, is 1 Corinthians 8, 6. And that it is him, him that we are supposed to serve. Not our flesh. Satan uses, tries to entice us through the flesh, offering us godhood. He tries to entice us through the world, offering us godhood. As long as we worship Satan in the end. We're not supposed to be worshipping our flesh. We're not supposed to be worshipping the world. We're not supposed to be worshipping Satan. Those are the three enemies. Almost like a trinity. Those are the three enemies. Okay. Satan always promises Godhood, but in the end, Satan is the one that wants to be worshipped. Matthew chapter 4, verse 9. Matthew chapter 4, verse 9. We were just there, I'm sorry, but we were already there. Sorry. I just want to reread re re -read that real quick. All th these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now, if you turn to Isaiah 14, 14, go back to when he was an anointed cherub. And he fell. He lost his first estate. Why did he lose his first estate? The Isaiah 14, 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He wants to replace God. That's ultimately, that's the deception. That's why we always try to preach the truth to people. Satan doesn't love anyone he lies to. He doesn't love them. He's just using them. Why? So he can be the most like the Most High. And he doesn't care who he loses. He doesn't. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Now turn to 1 Corinthians 8, 6. I said this is a strong verse to prove the Godhead of the King James Bible and disprove the Trinity. Because the Trinity preaches that you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three separate gods. And they teach that God the Son is not God the Father. God the Holy Spirit is not God the Son. God the Holy Spirit is not God the Father. And I agree with them. God the Son and God the Holy Spirit is not God the Father. There's no such thing as God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. It's the Son of God. God manifests in the flesh. The Son of God. If I could draw it like God the Father, Son of God. Son of God the Father. God manifests in the flesh. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the Spirit of God the Father. God the Father is a Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Okay? But they try to say these three things. But 1 Corinthians 8, 6 disproves that. But to us there is but one capital G God, the Father. There's only one. There's only one God, the something, and it's God the Father. Period. 
That's how you can tell if someone's truly a Bible believer. When they read this and you teach them the truth about the Godhead versus the Trinity, do they stick to the Godhead of the King James Bible or some pagan, t t uh, pagan God title that's not even found in Scripture? I would say this, capital T Trinity, where is it at for a, t for a title for God in the Scriptures? Not there. Where is it a description of God in the Scriptures? Not there. But it's always used as a title, and they claim, oh, no, it's just a description, and then they turn around and use it as a title, and when you catch them, they're like, oh, no, no, it's just, just, just double-minded men. What does the Bible say about double-minded men? They're unstable in all their ways. Now, I don't want to get on. This isn't a, a Godhead teaching, but, but to us, there's but one God, the Father. Satan wants to be worshipped as God the Father. He does. Of whom are all things, and we in him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. There's only one capital L, Lord Jesus Christ. Now we've seen Lord used for God, and we've seen God used for Jesus Christ. But there is no God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's a lie. Chapter and verse. Brothers and sisters Christ, I, I was going to end that with this study with this, but brothers and sisters Christ, we need to get back to chapter and verse. We're getting away from that. This great man of God up there, he said, that he said it this way, and it sounded good, so I'm just going to go with it. What happened to our attitude of chapter and verse? But I said, what happened to that attitude? It was a good attitude to have. You can love me as a brother in Christ and still have the attitude that you confront me when I say something and say, chapter and verse. Now, if I say this is kind of a theory, God's working on me, I'm still studying the issue out, and this is a theory, be careful. You're going to yell at me all you want, and I'm not going to say anything when you say chapter and verse, because I said it's a theory, and I threw some verses out. But if I say, thus saith the Lord, this is absolute truth, there's times I pwc something, brothers of this Christ. Polly won a cracker. I heard a great man of God, that I believe is a great man of God, preach a preaching, and it sounded good, and I parroted what he said, and I pushed that preaching on to other people, and I had a brother or sister in Christ come to me and say, hey, chapter and verse on that. And I started looking. It wasn't there. I got caught being a PWC. I need to line up with the scriptures. Thank you, brother says Christ. By all means, say chapter and verse, chapter and verse. That's a good thing. We're getting away from that. We're becoming respecter of persons. Whatever that man says, it sounds good. If he's taking verses out of context, who cares? It sounds good. If he's adding to God's word, subtracting from God's word, oh, it's okay, it sounds good. And it's coming from him. He's a great man of God. No, we need to be back to chapter and verse. There's but one capital G, God the Father. And that's who we're supposed to be worshiping and serving through Jesus Christ, his Son. And because... Jesus Christ is God the Father, manifest in the flesh, body and soul are connected, they are one, we can worship Jesus Christ as God the Father. Okay? But God, the one true God, God the Father, through His Son Jesus Christ, is the only person, Jesus has a body, soul, and spirit, He's the only person that we worship. Not Satan, not this man right here, not this wicked body of flesh. Not the world and the world's way and what the world has to offer to get you to worship Satan, the lowercase g God of this world. Definitely not Satan. Turn to 1 Timothy 2.5. 1 For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now the important question is, did you go through the one meter between you and the one true God, the Father, or were you deceived by Satan? Were you deceived by Satan through the world? Were you deceived by Satan through the lust of the flesh? And getting you to worship him as a false god. The Bible teaches that the true plan of salvation is repentance towards God. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. In the Psalms it talks about God saveth such who are of a broken and contrite spirit. You have to come to God broken, having sorrow and regret for your personal sins that are sending you to hell, God's sending you to hell because of your personal sins, and you're on your way to hell, and you deserve to go to hell for sinning against God, and you're sorry. 
Once again, brothers and Christ, this is true biblical salvation that Satan doesn't want you to follow. Repentance is just works. It's a workspace. It happens in the heart, brothers and sisters of Christ. We know that. And if there's a false convert watching this, it happens in the heart. But if you're a servant of Satan, you're going to keep quoting these lies and keep pushing these lies. Repentance is works. It just works. Repentance is just going from unbelief to belief. That's also a lie. Repentance is just admitting you're a sinner. That's a half-truth. That's not the full truth. It's not just admitting you're a sinner, because the lost world does that. It's coming to God having sorrow for said sin that you're admitting. I am a sinner, Lord. I'm on my way to hell. I deserve to go to hell for sinning against you. Lord, I am so sorry. I wish I never sinned. I wish I was never in this predicament, my body, in this condition, this sick and wicked condition, O oh Lord. I'm so sorry, O oh Lord. Is there nothing I can do? No, there's nothing you can do, but there's something I did for you. This is God, the Father, saying, there's nothing you can do, but there's something I did for you. And he points to his son, Jesus Christ. That's where the belief comes in. The next step in finding the God's grace, the plan of salvation, the second step, is belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. I always point this out there because people don't talk about it that much these days. You realize Jesus was beaten beyond recognition. He had his beard ripped out. They spit in his face and spit, all, spit on him. They put a crown of thorn on his head and it just dug into his skull, and they were hitting it with sticks. They were uh, making fun of him. They whipped him within an inch of his life. You know that saying, within, in other words, he was on the verge of death because they whipped him so much and he was bleeding so much. They paraded him where everyone could mock him and see him. They, they, they humiliated him. Made him carry his cross and paraded him. And then, of course, Simon of Suri, I think it was, uh, helped him carry the cross the rest of the way. But they took him up. They nailed him to the cross. He bled out on the cross and died on the cross because of your sins. That's when that sorrow gets magnified. That repentance, that godly sorrow gets magnified when you look and go, He did that for me? And when he said it is finished, is Jesus Christ is God, manifest in the flesh. It was God's blood that was shed on the cross. God's blood that can cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That can wash your sins away, whiter than snow. And that he died, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's in 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 3 and 4. He did that for me? That's why repentance is so important. And in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 3 and 4, they said, where's repentance at? How he died for our sins. How he died. You're telling me you have no sorrow for that? These false converts that want what Satan has to offer. He offers them a, the world. He tries to show them a fake back door. Let them think they're going to heaven when they die. And he offers them the world. And they take it hook, line, and sinker. And they attack true biblical salvation, true biblical repentance. Then that belief is not up here, it's down here when you have true biblical repentance. Remember, for sorrow happens here. Belief happens here. How do we know belief happens here, not up here? You have some brethren, I remember some great men of God, that they would mock this. They would mock it. Did you believe in your head or did you believe in your heart? And they'd mock it. The Bible says, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Repentance happens in the heart. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Did you come to God broken and truly believe? You confess both those in prayer. Your repentance and your belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, you confess it in prayer. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You ask God to save you. There's a movement that's been going on for several years now where you have men claiming to be Bible believers. That, that, that's part, I believe it's part of the falling away, but it's also satanic. You have men that claim to be Bible believers. They take repentance out and it's believe and say a prayer and ask God to save you. Now they've taken prayer out and it's only belief, head belief. Only believe, only believe. 
Yeah, you ask him chapter and verse where it says faith alone. This whole faith alone pagan movement, false movement. We are saved by God's grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Okay? For by grace are ye saved. We're saved by God's grace. How do you find that grace? All throughout the Bible, brother, says Christ, I'm a dispensational teacher because it's absolute truth. All throughout the Bible, God is saving mankind by His grace. But how to find that grace is different in the different dispensations. Okay? Sometimes it's faith. Sometimes it's faith and works. Sometimes it's just works. Well, how do you find God's grace today? This is the only time period where it's been faith, 100% just faith. Through faith. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Faith, it takes faith to repent. It takes faith to believe. I mean, repent, you're fallen before God you've never seen before. And having sorrow for wronging someone you've never seen. Remember what faith is in the book of Hebrews? It says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You're, you're repenting. You're falling on your knees and having uh, before a God that you've never seen before, having sorrow for wronging a God that you've never seen before. It takes faith to re true biblical repentance. It takes true faith to believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It takes true faith to confess both in prayer. Once again, you're praying to a God that you're hoping and praying that He's hearing you and that He's there. That takes faith. And then you ask that same God to please, the one true God, please save me. There's 1 Corinthians 8, 6. But to us, there's one capital G, God the Father. He sacrificed his son so we could go to heaven. For, uh, back to Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works. Now, the not of works here is talking about there's nothing I can do to earn salvation. Jesus Christ did it for me. It is finished. On the cross, he said, it is finished. It is finished. Now that I'm saved, I'm sealed into the day of redemption. I can't lose salvation, and you can't merit salvation. You can't earn salvation. You can't lose it. You can't earn it. That's what that's saying. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Paul talks about that once. I don't have this in my notes about how, lest I should boast. Talk about how Jesus needs to be the focus. What he did is what matters. Okay? But people don't keep reading. After salvation. After salvation. Verse 10. For we, who's the we? Those who found God's grace going through faith. They followed the true plan of salvation. Repentance towards God. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer. And ask God to save you. They followed the true steps. The true plan of salvation. To find that grace. You got that grace. God saves you. He seals you into the day of redemption. Now what? For we are created in Christ Jesus. This is verse 10. For we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works that have before been ordained that we should walk in them. The change life. See, Satan tries to get us to worship him before we get saved to try to prevent us from getting saved. But ultimately, if someone doesn't get saved, it's on them. They can't blame Satan. They can't blame this wicked body of flesh. They can't blame the world. The only person they can blame is the me, myself, and I. There's another trinity. Me, myself, and I. When they promise you you can be gods, I got three gods. Me, myself, and I. Not me personally, but I'm talking about this, the world. When Satan offers them godhood. Me, myself, and I. They can't blame anybody but themselves. But Satan, when he realizes, hey, this brother got saved, the next step he does is he tries to get, pull you away from God. And the Bible talks about that, how God, how I've espoused you to one husband, Jesus Christ. Our God is a jealous God. We're not supposed to have any other gods beside him. So what does he do? He gets the brethren to fail. And they gets the brethren to start acting like lowercase g gods themselves. He tries to hinder that changed life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin, living any longer therein? The old man, don't you know that the old man is dead and buried with Christ and the new man is raised? That's how you believe in these people with head belief. They don't repent. They even take prayer out. They have head belief. They believe in vain. Why? Because if there's no new birth, they don't believe in a real resurrection. They don't truly believe in a resurrection that Jesus was raised from the dead. They can say it all they want. They don't believe it. They just have the head knowledge of it. They don't believe it if there's no changed life. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 is all talking about. The resurrection, that believing in vain. Our changed life is our physical showing that we believe, truly believe, that Jesus was raised from the dead. We gave our lives to Jesus Christ on the cross, and the new, we got a new life. Jesus gave us a new life. Okay. Satan wants to be worshipped as God. And brother says, Christ, I'm talking to you. Has he tried to talk you into being worshipped, that you start acting like a God when it comes to the scriptures? A uh, better rendering would be, Yea, hath God said. No, I can take this out of context. I can just ignore this passage completely. I don't have to rightly divide anymore. I don't have to be a good steward of the scriptures. I don't have to search the scriptures daily to see if those things are so. That man up there is telling me what I want to hear. Does it line up with the scriptures? Ah, who cares? That man can be a lowercase g God. I'll be a respecter of persons, and that man can be a lowercase g God to me. Things of this world start becoming, that's the, you know, the things of this world start becoming lowercase g gods. Idolatry. When you start putting things down here that are more important than things up there, Paul talked about that. The things that are temporal versus the things that are eternal. What are we supposed to be focusing on, brother, says Christ? Things that are eternal. The stuff down here doesn't last. Praise God for everything he's blessed me with, but I wouldn't let any of this stuff get in the way of my walk with the Lord. Sometimes it does, but we're not supposed to. But this is Christ. Are you letting Satan entice you with being your own lowercase g God and correcting the book? Starting to go the way of the world. Starting to look like the world, kind of acting like the world. Having the same priorities as the world. The temporal is what's important, not the eternal. You say, well, why are we talking about this when we're talking about Satan and, and he's the devil and hell was created for him? Okay. Well, before we get to that, because there's still a few more steps I want to make, if, if you bear with me, brother, says Christ, turn to James 4, 7. Why are we talking about salvation again? James 4, 7. Satan wants to be worshipped. And Satan's going to wind up in hell, or not hell, in the lake of fire, to burn for all eternity. Everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. James 4, 7. We, a lot of people like to go, James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee. Is that true? Well, if that's all the information, some of you, if you're reading your Bibles, you're going to say, wait a minute, brother, didn't you leave something out? We're going to get to that. But when I was first told about that verse, it's resist the devil. That's all he says. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Is this true? Turn to Acts 19.13. We're going to use the Bible as an example. Is this true? Or are they leaving important things out? See, Satan's always about that too. He offers Godhood, and the other thing Satan does is he'll quote half verses. He'll take half the verse and drop half the verse out. Sometimes he'll take half the verse and add his own. He drops half out and puts in his own half of the verse that he likes to pervert the verse. Yea, hath God said. Turn to Acts chapter 19, verse 13. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached. Resist the devil and he must flee. Verse 14. And there were seven sons of seven, Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. Resist the devil and he must flee. How many of you guys heard people say that? Just resist the devil and he must flee. Verse 15. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know. But who are you? Who are you? Who are you to try to cast me out? Who are you to resist me? 
And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Wait, wait, wait. The Bible says resist the devil and he must flee. Why didn't he, that devil flee? It's a devil's. I know one resist the devil, Satan, but devils, why didn't they flee? Because you're not reading everything. You're not getting the context, and you're not reading the whole verse. Sometimes, I, I, I don't like doing that. I might only want part of the verse for the study, but I still try to read the whole verse because I don't want to look like I'm cutting things up. Okay. Let's go back to James 4.4. 4. Go back to James. Remember we read 4.7. Resist the devil and he must flee from you. How about we get the context? James 4.4. 4. Ye adulteresses and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enemy with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Stop right there. Brothers, says Christ, resist the devil and he must flee. How many of you, and I've done this, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be the first one to admit it because I'm not going to be prideful. Uh, vanity, ego. I have opened, in my life as a Christian, in my walk with a Christian, there's times where I've opened the door and invited Satan right on in. Why? When I got into the world in worldliness, idolatry and worldliness. When I got into the lust of the flesh and invited sin into my home. When I invited lost uh, pagan practices and pagan things into my home. I opened the door and let Satan right on in. When I was newly saved, I struggled with giving up Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games. Satanic style music, cartoons, anime. I also was addicted, and I'm ashamed of it, I was addicted to porn before I got saved. All this wickedness, God got it out of my life. What happens when you start to fall back into it, trying to resurrect the old man? You're opening the door and you're letting Satan ride on in. And I, I'm going to kick it too. What about hell days? I call them holidays, but holidays that are pagan in origin. We proved it. They're pagan in origin. You start bringing in a Christmas tree. It's proven that the Christmas tree is an idol. It's a pagan god. In the Old Testament, they were taking trees. They were adorning them with gold and silver. They were putting their gods on top. And they were putting their gift offerings underneath. What does that sound like, brothers and sisters in Christ? It's just so frustrating. I get frustrated. I love you, my brother, says Christ, but I get frustrated with this man first and foremost every time I fail the Lord and open the door. And I get frustrated with the body of Christ how much you guys are opening the door for him. Oh, Satan, come right on in. And then you say, resist the devil and he will flee. Why isn't he fleeing? I'm telling him to get out. You let him in. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It talks about Satan being the father of lies. He's a liar and the father of it. He's the ch children of the, the, you have children of the devil. They're just all flesh, lusts of the flesh. That's his domain. We're not supposed to be like that anymore, brother says Christ. I still, we still fail sometimes. What does the Bible say? Take up thy cross daily. First, you have to deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow Jesus Christ. Repent, forsake, get back to your walk with the Lord. But for this study, there's people that just open the door and just let him right on in. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm saved though, you know, and I'm resisting the devil. But why won't he flee? Let's keep going here. Verse 5, do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelt in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud. You have some men in ministry that are so proud of their idolatry, their sin, and their wickedness. They're so proud of how they're adding to and subtracting from the word of God so they can live the life that they want to live instead of living the life that God has commanded them to live. God resists the crowd, but giveth grace unto the humble. 
Verse 7, here's the part that gets left out of verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Those people that were trying to use Jesus' name to cast out devils that we read about, did they submit themselves to God? Did they go through the true plan of salvation? No. They didn't submit themselves to God. They didn't humble themselves. Now we're going to go through this. It's almost, talks, almost like it's talking about salvation. Because we're going to break this down a little bit. But submit yourselves therefore to God. When you've done that, resist the devil and he must flee. The first command God gives us today is obey the gospel. It's the first command. It's the first thing of submitting yourself to God. It's the first time you resist the devil and he has to flee. It's when you come to God broken at salvation, submitting yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Brother says Christ, anytime I open the door and I let Satan in, whether it's through lusts of the flesh, getting back into sin and wickedness, old uh, addictions, or whether it's I find myself getting distracted by the world and getting into worldliness, doing things the world's way, compromising so I can have things of the world, compromising this right here so I can have things of the world, you know what you do? You go back to the cross and submit yourself to God. Repent. Take up, uh, deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow Jesus Christ. Repent, forsake, get back to your walk with the Lord. You have to go back to the cross and submit yourself to the cross. And remember, God saved me from all this, the consequences of all this sin that I just let back in my life. Lord, get it back out of my life again. You're resisting the flesh, you're resisting the world, you're resisting Satan, your whole walk with the Lord, you have to resist. And when you fail, you've got to go back to submitting yourself to God. You're not done for, brothers and Christ, when you fail. It's not the end of the world. It's not over. Repent, forsake, and get your heart back right with God. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Go back to the cross if you have to, to remind yourself why you got saved, why you needed to get saved, who it is that saved you, and who it is you're supposed to be serving. You're not supposed to be serving this. This body of flesh. You're not supposed to be serving this as far as like when it comes to respecter of persons. Philip Newton, the respecter of persons. You're not supposed to be serving the world. You're not supposed to be serving Satan. Some brother can get talked into pushing satanic doctrine. Doctrines of devils, the Bible talks about. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God. Evidence, I'm getting ahead of myself, but evidence that you've, you've uh, resist, did, submitted yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. And purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Today, I, you just, brother says Christ, I come across a lot of double-minded professing Christians. I believe some of them are saved. I love the Word of God, but then you get caught adding to and subtracting from it. This is, tells us how we're supposed to live, and then you find yourself in some areas of your life, you're living contrary to what this what God's Word says we're supposed to live. Double-minded. Purify your hearts. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. First thing, can you, can, cannot be a friend to the world. Here's the steps to how you can truly resist the devil and he must flee. Cannot be a friend to the world. Lust is to envy. 1 John 2.16 reads, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father. There's but to us what? One capital G God, the Father. But is of the world. Who's the lowercase g God of this world? Satan. You cannot be a friend to the world and be a servant of God, the Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. It cannot be the world's way, the flesh's way, Satan's way, and God's way. You can't have it both ways, brother, sister, Christ. And some of us, and I did it before in my past, some of us have tried. Oh, God will forgive us. Oh, God will forgive me. Oh, it won't hurt too much.
It's got to be God's way, brother says Christ. If you want to be able to resist the devil and he must flee, you can't be a friend of the world, conform to the world, love the world. You cannot give in to the flesh. You've always got to put the flesh down. The moment I always say this, brother says you give the flesh an inch, it'll take a mile. You give the world, the world an inch, it'll take a thousand miles. You give Satan an inch, he'll take everything he can. And I say that to be, as, not to lose my temper, but brothers says Christ, that's how important it is not to give in. That's why we put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the wilds against the devil. Have done all to stand. How many of you are kneeling down? How many of you are falling flat on your face? You cannot be a friend of the world and lust attend the end resist the devil. It won't work. Verse 2. You have to humble yourself before God. God resisteth the proud but giveth grace unto the humble. Turn to Ephesians 2.8. We'll go through it again. I already went through it, but we'll go through it again. 2.8. For by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The first step in the coming to finding God's grace through faith is humbling yourself. A broken and contrite spirit. Verse 10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which hath before been ordained that we should walk in them. When you humble yourself and you come to God broken saying, My way isn't working. My way is wrong. God, I need to do things your way. My way is wrong, the flesh is, uh, the flesh is way, the world's way is wrong, Satan's way is wrong. Lord, show me the right way. And he will. You have to humble yourself. Remember, you've resisted the devil first time at salvation. And now you have to resist him throughout your whole walk with the Lord. You resist the flesh, you resist the world, you resist Satan. The lowercase you got this world. And the reason I throw the flesh and the world in there is because those are the two things Satan uses. To try to entice you, he knocks at the door. The world comes knocking and offers you something you want, and you sacrifice something God wants for you for something Satan wants for you. There's people that do it. I believe there's people that are saved that do it. They get really messed up, and they become part of the falling away. Okay? Three, so you can't be a friend of the world. You have to humble yourself before God. Three, you have to submit yourself, therefore, to God. Like I kind of got ahead of myself. It's your way, Lord. My way doesn't work. The world's way doesn't work. Satan's way definitely doesn't work. You have to submit yourself to God. God, I'm going to do things your way. You have to come to him on his terms, the true plan of salvation. After that, God opens this book to you and teaches you how to live. All scriptures given by inspiration of God is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, having a perfect heart. Perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You submit yourself to God and say, God, it's your way, not my way. Thy will be done, not mine. Help my will to line up with yours, Lord. And when my will doesn't line up with yours, my will gets th thrown in the trash and I grab yours. God's will comes first. You have to submit yourself to God. Why isn't Satan and the devils, these evil spirits, not fleeing from some of these people? They're not saved. Why is it not fleeing from people that are saved? Because you're not submitting yourself to God. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. You're right, I'm wrong. Your way, not my way. Romans 10.3. Romans 10.3. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, not your way, God, I'm going to do it my way. I've earned salvation with my faith. Just head belief. I only had to believe. I've earned salvation through works, because there's some people who believe that. I'm going to go through my way, part, be part of whatever false religion, organized religion, club that they want to be part of. They have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. In flaming fire. Uh-oh, they were back down to how hell was propelled for the devil and his angels. In 
No, everlasting fire. I say hell. I want to make sure I'm saying it right. Not hell. It's everlasting fire. Everlasting fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. Here we are back to it again. 2 Thessalonians 1.8 And flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God. The one true God. Capital G God. God the Father. One true God. The God of the, of the Godhead. Not the, the false gods. Plural of the Trinity. But the capital G God of the Godhead. They know not God. And they obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's the first command when you submit yourself to God? Obey the gospel. You come to him broken. I'm wrong. You're right. I'm dirty, rotten, filthy, low down, no good sinner. You are holy, just, and true. What do I do? The first command, obey the gospel. I don't want to go to hell. What do I do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Who is hell prepared for? The devil and his angels. You wind up there, you're going to wind up in a place where Satan's going to be. Can you? I don't want people to really imagine that, but can you imagine someone who listens to Satan their whole life and ignores we're preaching the truth gospel to them? All these false Christians, fake Christians, easy believism. We're preaching the true plan of salvation to them. And they're just listening to what Satan has to offer. They're listening to Satan in the world. And they're just listening to him. And they wind up in hell. And they're like, Ugh! and they turn around and look to the right. And there's Satan standing right next to him suffering just as much as he is. Why would you want to end up in the same place as Satan? Brothers and sisters Christ, we're in the last days. We need to keep preaching the truth. We need to get out there. We need to gospel tract. We need to witness for Jesus Christ. When doors open, we need to witness. Today, it seems like some of the brethren have turned their backs on the world as far as they don't love the world. There was a preacher that used to teach that loving the lost world, true love for the lost world, was preaching the truth to them. The gospel of Jesus Christ. He's lost that love. He now hates the world. No, let him go to hell. So men have become like that. You have to submit yourselves before God if you want to be able to truly resist the devil and he must flee. The fourth step. If you're hearing the steps, my daughter Victoria, my mentor Schnauzer, woke up. Now, fourth step. Now you can resist the devil and he will flee. Now you can. Okay? You're not, you've made sure that you're not a friend of the world. And I always those others that love not the world. You're not loving the world. You're not a friend of the world. You're not conforming. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You can't do that, that last part, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God if you're conforming to the world, if you're loving the world, if you're being a friend of the world. What we're reading right there in James 4.4. 4. Now you can resist the devil. You've separated yourself from the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. You've humbled yourself before God. You've submitted yourself, therefore, to God. Now you can resist the devil and he will flee. 1 Peter 5.8 1 Peter 5.8 This is the one. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in you, brethren, that are in the world. I'm not the only one struggling with this. Brother says, Christ, you're not the only one struggling with it. In these last days, we're all struggling with this situation of not giving into the flesh, not giving into the world, trying to resist Satan, trying to stick to God's way, do things God's way, the right way. Right. Give me a second. She's got to make her full round and go all the way around. We get her back in her seat. Sorry about that, brother. Says Christ. Evidence. You follow these steps. What's the evidence that you follow these steps, brother? Says Christ. What did we just read up there. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. There's brethren out there that love their sin and they're promoting sin. 
What's evidence that you follow the proper steps to resist the devil? You draw close to God and he draws close to you. Your walk with the Lord gets stronger. Your Bible reading gets stronger. Your Bible studying gets stronger. Your prayer life gets stronger. Your praise, your worship life, giving God praise and thanks in all things and glory in all things, it increases. Your, your walk with the Lord is so strong and you're so close to God. And the evidence of that, like we said, you sinners purify your hearts, you double-minded. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Okay. Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we either dead to sin, living longer therein? King David in the Psalms said, If I hold iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. I find it very hard to believe these brethren out there that are vehemently defending I, I knew brethren, I, I don't, I, I'm not saying that they are professing, but some of them I believe were professing brethren. I don't believe they were truly saved. They were just trying to be part of the Bible-believing club. Uh, instead of actually being Bible believers here, they're just trying to be part of a club. Okay? But there was a man that he was pushing Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, anime, satanic-style music. This is okay. Don't tell me that man has a close relationship with the Lord and is doing those things. No. uh there's another man out there that he's pushing holidays that, well, some might be bad, but some are okay. And he gets to pick be he gets to play God and pick and choose what holidays are okay and which ones aren't. Don't tell me he has a close relationship with the Lord. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. But it's just Christ, when I was newly saved, anytime I got into the lusts of the flesh and started getting I'm putting out my computer over here, started getting back into video games and Hollywood movies and TV shows, you know what it did? It hindered my Bible reading life. It hindered my Bible studying life. It hindered my prayer life. It hindered my worship life, giving God glory and giving Him thanks in all things and praising Him. It got in the way. It always does. What do you got to do? You got to go back to the first step. You can't be a friend of the world. Lusteth to envy. Can't be about the flesh, the world. You got to submit. Your, you got to humble yourself before God. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. And then you can resist the devil and get those things out of your life. If any man come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow me. Okay? Like I said, it's almost like it's talking about salvation. When we're reading these steps, and it is. But it's also the life of a Christian. You start resisting the devil at salvation. You start resisting the devil, because the devil uses your flesh against you, the devil uses the world against you. So that's why I throw the flesh and the world in with it. You resist the flesh, the world, you're, you're resisting Satan. The lowercase g God of this world. Okay. Turn to 2 Corinthians 11. Why is this so important? I know some of you are getting it, praise God. Some of you are probably still at the point where this, well, whatever, I don't care, I like living the way I'm living. You're not going to listen. I'm going to still try to preach the truth to you. But some of you aren't listening still. 2 Corinthians 11. I meant 1 Corinthians. We need 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 1 through 4. Why is it so important, this talk about the Satan? Because like I said, we started out with just a brother. We're talking about the devil and the hell's made for the devil. Who the devil is, who devils are. How did we get to here? Here's why, because the very, first we start this study with, sometimes you can go on rabbit trails, but hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41. Then shall, he, then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, and everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. How did we get to, to what we've been talking about so far? 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. Bear with me, Lord, in my folly. Brothers says Christ, bear with me in my folly. I'm not perfect. But you know who is perfect? Jesus Christ. You know what else is perfect? His word. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 
There's only one way to get saved today. There's only one way to find God's grace today, and it's through faith. And it's the faith that was revealed to Paul. Okay. I present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear that by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Satan's going to try to mess you up, brother, says Christ, every chance he gets. And you know what? When I say any chance he gets, you know most of the time that he gets an opportunity to mess you up is when you open the door and you let him in. Like we talked about. When you let sin back into your life, worldliness back into your life, how you treat the brethren. The Bible says if you've sinned against the brethren, you've sinned against Christ. How you treat the lost world. You're supposed to be a light to the law of this dark world. And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Okay? The simplicity that is in Christ. Satan comes in tries to mess people up that get saved. And I've seen people that get saved off the true plan of salvation and they start going to easy believism. The simplicity that is in Christ. Now, real quick, because sometimes I get to talking. Brothers of Christ, I believe if you truly repented, you'll never repent of, of repenting. So most of the time when I say that I said saved sinners that went to false gospels, those aren't saved sinners. I, I slipped to the tongue. Those are false converts. And this is what we're going to read right here. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus... The Jesus that's popular in this world today is Satan. A counterfeit Jesus, an antichrist Jesus, is Satan. And he offers you the world. And that's popular to people. I can get saved and continue living however I want to live. I can, I can get saved and keep going after the lust of the flesh. I can get saved and still have idolatry and be worldly. Sign me up. And people are signing up by the millions, and they're going to hell by the millions. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which we have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear, might well bear with him. Who's the him? The he that cometh that preacheth another Jesus. Who's the he? Him here also. Satan. Remember verse 3, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve. Who's that serpent? We just read that's the title for Satan. That serpent beguiled Eve. Ye might well bear with him. Everlasting fire, what was it prepared for? The devil and his angels. When you reject the true plan of salvation, if anybody that's watching this has rejected the true plan of salvation as part of these false gospels, you need to truly get saved, or you're going to wind up where Satan's going to wind up. And that's hell. Hell, everlasting fire. Might well bear with him. Satan. All these people preaching the false gospels, they're on their way to hell, and they want you to go to hell with them. It's that simple. They want to have the world and have a free pass to heaven. And it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. We're almost done. A couple more. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Thank you for brothers and sisters of Christ that have bared with me this long. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? You know what hinders your, your, that spiritual fellowship with God? When you start getting back into unrighteousness. The Bible, we just read all these verses talking about it. When you start getting back into the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the world's way. It hinders your walk with the Lord. What prevents people from getting saved? That unrighteousness that they, they don't, they, they're okay with it. We talked about repentance. Just admitting that you're unrighteous, that doesn't do anything. You know, the verse says, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth, there's none that seeketh after God. They've all gone together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. There's none that doeth good. You can admit that you're unrighteous, but where's that broken, heartfelt attitude of being sorry for being unrighteous? Everyone I come across that's part of the easy believe, the mostly believe, only believe, they love their unrighteousness. They've given up some unrighteousness, but there's a lot of unrighteousness that they still hold on to and they love, and there's nothing wrong with it. And who are you to judge me? 
A little bit don't hurt. We know when to quit. It all depends on how you look at it. Who are you to judge me? Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, sodomy, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Oh no, there doesn't have to be a changed life. Oh, you can have a perfect relationship with the Lord and continue in your sin and continue in the lust of the flesh, continue in the idolatry and worldliness. Oh, you can, you can still have a great life. Be not deceived, brothers and sisters in Christ. That's a lie. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God, that spiritual fellowship with the Lord. Verse 11, and here's the key here. Verse 11. And such were some of you. Past tense. God saves you. He gives you a new life. He cleans it up. And now such were some of you. And those are called testimonies. I've got testimony after testimony of how God cleaned up my life and got sin and wickedness out of my life. How He strengthened my fellowship, that kingdom of God, that spiritual fellowship with the Lord. I pray more now. I spend more time in the Word of God now. I spend more time praising God and singing hymns. I spend more time fellowshipping with brothers and sisters in Christ. My life is 100% about God now. Not the flesh, not the world, not Satan. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Can't be a friend of the world. Humble yourself before God. Submit yourself, therefore, God, to His way. Sanctification. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Instruction righteous is one of the things this book is for us. To help clean up our life so we're glorifying God and pleasing God. In the Old Testament, it's in the book of Hebrews, but it's talking about the Old Testament, uh, Enoch. Enoch, before he was caught up, he had this testimony. What was that testimony? That he pleased God. Not his flesh, not the world, not Satan. He pleased God. Right. Turn to John chapter 2. Turn to 1 John, sorry, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. He pleased God. You don't want to end up where Satan ends up, brothers, sisters, Christ. Uh, we need to be pushing that among the, the false converts out there, amongst the lost world. We need to be pushing. They don't want to end up where, where Satan's going to end up. You don't have to go to the everlasting fire. You don't have to go to hell and then get tossed in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. You don't. Okay. What's holding him back? This is. The flesh, if I can do this, the flesh. Lust of the flesh. The world. They're listening to Satan and what he's offering them. A false gospel. A false Jesus. Getting him to, 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 to receive another spirit. Which is why I'm reading this real quick. 1 John 2, we're going to start in 12. I write unto you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because we know, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. Resist the devil, and he must flee. Young men, it starts at salvation. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. There is but one God, capital G God, the Father. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you. And ye have overcome the wicked one. The word of God. Are you hiding God's word in your heart? That's how we were able to go through all the steps, because we got it from God's word. And we take these steps that God from God's word, and we hide it in our heart, and now we know how to resist the devil. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Including resisting the devil. But you got to go through Christ. His word. 
Then we get to verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things in, that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I have that verse memorized, but sometimes we need to keep reading and get the context, brother, says Christ. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. All these false gospels that teach you that you can have the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and be saved and go to heaven, they're false gospels. After salvation, true conversion, there's going to be a changed life and God's going to clean your life up. It's guaranteed. Some brethren get that clean up where they're cleaning up their life and they might hit that wall. I always talk about like they're running 100 miles and excited for the Lord and that first wall they hit or that first pit they didn't see that they fall into, they tend to stay down for a while. They start trying to resurrect the old man. But there was a changed life at first before they fell and before they started resurrecting the old man. The changed life is guaranteed. Verse 17, And the world passeth away. None of this stuff is worth it, brother says Christ. This body of flesh is going to die and get buried and it's just become worm food. This world is going to pass away someday, but the things of this world that you collect... You can't take it with you. If you're going to heaven, you can't take it with you. If you're going to hell and then the lake of fire, you can't take it with you there. This world perish, passeth away. This, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth someday. And the lust thereof, all this is going to be gone someday. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. What's the first, what's God's will? That none should perish, but all should come to repentance. Oh, but repentance isn't part of salvation. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You skip repentance, you're not going to abide with God forever. You're going to abide with your lowercase g God, Satan, forever. Verse 18, little children is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, wait, 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 we're talking about loving the world and what's in the world. Who's the lowercase g God of the world? Satan. Then it gets into the Antichrist. Little children, is the last time. And as ye have heard that that Antichrist shall come, I have to correct myself. A brother corrected me. I took the correction and said that the man of sin, the son of perdition, is never called an Antichrist. He is right here. That Antichrist that shall come future tense. So yes, I have to make a correction again. That man of sin, the son of perdition, is called an antichrist. That antichrist that shall come. Even now are there many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. And then it goes in and talks about the antichrist spirits. Okay? The, he, he that's possessed. Let's see if I can get this right. Professing, it talks about uh, is come in the flesh versus has come in the flesh, which is a whole other debate and argument. But is come is the proper reading. And if someone doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, he has an antichrist spirit. When Paul's saying, if you receive another Jesus, you receive another gospel, you receive another spirit, which is an antichrist spirit. Okay? And that's what these people are doing. It's, it's, they're, it's linking the antichrist spirits with love in the world. We just read about conforming, not conforming to the world. I don't read it. We, I quoted, uh, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We just read about not being a friend of the world. Why? Because all this inter introduces evil spirits. Antichrist spirits. But there's this Christ, when you start falling into that and you open your door, you let Satan come right on in. And then you sit there and say, I changed my mind, get out. Are you going to continue doing that wickedness and that sin and that idolatry and that worldliness that let Satan in? Well, yeah, I'm, going to, I'm not letting that stuff go. I love that stuff. Then he's not going to flee from you. You have to submit yourselves to God if you want the devil or devils to flee from you. Okay? Brother Jesus Christ, he's going to the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Why would you want to listen to him in anything? 
in anything, when you have someone who's guaranteed to go to hell, and I'm not hell, but to the lake of fire, to burn for all eternity, why would you listen to anything he has to say? But he has good words and fair speeches. And what does he end up deceiving? The hearts of the simple. That's in the Bible. By good words and fair speeches, deceiving the hearts of the simple. What's the biggest way of keeping him from deceiving you? Do you know this book? Are you staying in it, brother, sister Christ? Are you reading it? Are you memorizing some scripture? Are you hiding it in your heart? Are you living it? The best way to resist the devil, and he must flee. Submit yourself to God. Submit yourself to his word. All right. I hope this helps and encourages and exhorts the brethren. That was the whole point of this. I know some of you might feel convicted. That's a good thing. Get your heart right with the Lord. Get your life right with the Lord. It's not the end of the world, and if, if you, you didn't hit a wall where there's nothing you can do, God can break that wall back down and help you get going again. You just got to come to Him and humble yourself and submit yourself to Him. Deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow Jesus Christ. Get back to your walk with the Lord. And above all, stick with the book, the Word of God. This is the final authority, not Satan. This guy right here is not the final authority. I always say this, brothers and Christ, let's find out where the Bible is right and I'm wrong. I need to line up with this because this is the final authority. This is perfect. I am not. James 1.5 If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abrayeth not, and it shall be given him. She's doing her rounds again. Forgive me, brothers and Christ. But I love my brother and sister Christ. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next study.